Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on weird and true mysterious stories, from glitches to the paranormal. Case file number 1651, written by Linda Maiden. On the back roads of Indiana, our minds were shattered. This happened to me in December 1969. I am a retired registered nurse. I have experienced or witnessed many things that are beyond understanding. But I'm also a critical thinker, and my story changed my thoughts on our limited view of reality forever. I was with my high school boyfriend on a typical Friday date night in Jeffersonville, Indiana. After socializing with friends at the local hangouts, we would ride out on the rural back roads that were located between downtown and my home in a subdivision. There were dairy farms and cornfields on either side of the road for about six miles. The few homes along this stretch sat on the back of properties and there were a couple of equipment paths that led to small open fields that were our, teenagers, parking spots. Past that, the two-lane narrow road was heavily wooded, with no homes or cleared property for 10 miles. This particular road had many curves and hills, which is typical for southern Indiana. Sparse population and teenage driving led to many accidents. There were no cell phones in those days, and you'd need luck if one saw an accident and were to stop help and pray for another motorist to appear to flag down, to send to the nearest house, to call for police and an ambulance or transport the victims to the hospital yourself. It was a very cold December night and snow flurries began. We left our parking area immediately as my curfew wasn't to be missed. The remainder of our drive to my home was through the wooded area, and on straightaways we saw taillights quite a bit ahead. As we were approaching the second sharp curve, we saw headlights shining from ground level and at an angle towards us. We immediately slowed and pulled as far off the road as possible. The grill was damaged and the passenger side had struck trees. The headlights and the otherwise pitch black night were blinding. A fully restored beautiful 1956 Chevy had apparently tried to take the curve too fast, had lost control. The car was off the road on its roof. My boyfriend, Greg, grabbed his flashlight, got another for me along with the first aid kit from the trunk, and we ran to assist anyone that might be injured. The headlights had kept us from seeing how many passengers the car held. I clearly remember my heart pounding from the adrenaline and my mind fearing injuries, as nobody was shouting back to our calling out and nobody was attempting to get out of the car. I could smell the strong odor of gasoline and burned rubber. The engine was running and making a knocking sound. Greg got down on his knees and opened the driver's side door, and I opened the back. The car was empty. He reached up and turned the ignition. The engine was now off and the woods were silent. Nothing was making sense. Our headlights and flashlights were giving us light and we started searching for a possible injured person. The windows were rolled up and starting to fog. Greg had already searched the interior. At this point, our assumption was that the driver must have gotten out and we just hadn't seen him or her. We didn't understand why they hadn't answered us as we ran to help or why the car had been left running. We continued to search for a person around the wreck. We tried to go into the woods, but the underbrush and steep embarkment was impossible to climb. At this point, we decided whoever was driving may have just walked away. We got back into Greg's car and drove slowly three miles back, then turned around and drove slowly the next six, fully expecting to find someone needing a ride, or to a phone. We were relieved that the driver must not be hurt but couldn't imagine why they didn't see us and how they had left on foot without us seeing them. No other vehicles had come down the road. At this point, the remaining road we drove was covered with snow and we saw no tracks. We went to my house, where my parents were waiting as it was really late. Greg told my father what had happened and then described the car and how beautifully restored it was in case he knew to whom it belonged. The whole incident just left us baffled. By the next day, we decided that maybe there was a house in the woods or side road we missed. We both were just unsettled by it. We didn't know why we were worried about what now appeared to be a non-event. The next day, we went back to the scene of the accident. Both of us felt that we would find a house close by that had gone unnoticed or a side road, something. We didn't understand why we were still dwelling on it. But little did we know that quite the opposite was what we found. The car was still there but had been moved into a clearing in the trees. I will never understand what happened the night of the Chevy whose taillights we followed hit that curve and rolled. There it was, still on its roof. The damaged grill and front fender damage. The accident on Friday night. 
Here we stood on Sunday afternoon in the car. The paint was faded. The body was completely rusted through, over the majority of it. Tires were completely rotted and rims were rusted. The interior was dry, rotted, and covered with mold. The windows were gone and the windshield was broken with a basketball-sized hole, full of vines growing in and out of the car. The embankment we had tried to search was now a clearing, and setting further back into the woods was a small, abandoned, two-room shack. We later did a property search, but it only led us to the owners that had bought the acreage, with a shack and car on it. All we were left with was a lifetime of questions surrounding a cold December night. Quesant file 1651, on the back roads of Indiana, our minds were shattered. The clue, of course, is in the model of the car you saw, so the age of the car corresponds to the age that you were transported to. So I don't think it was a restored car, I think it was just factory brand new for that time. You and Greg were ported back in time to witness this crash. Although the mystery then is, what happened to the driver? Was it a case where you simply switch positions? So whoever was in the driver seat, or maybe the passenger as well, two for two, were transported to your timeline when you intersect the space-time portal that ported you to the past. What fascinates me most is how seamless these events are, and including the return, where you did go back to your own time. And when you did go back to check the car, you found out, yeah, the slow decay of time has ravages on anything, metal or otherwise. Although it is weird that they never went back to claim the car, even just for scrap, that has some value. Why just leave it in the embankment and never come back for it? Maybe they stole it? I don't know. Personally, I like to think of it as a seesaw or maybe a balance where you can place things on either side and depending on the weight of one, it'll rise and lower. I think it's, it's the same thing that applies in our universe for matter and energy. If you go back in time, you're not supposed to be there. The universe knows this instantly and so transposes someone else in your place to your timeline, at least until you return and then they switch back. The universe loves symmetry and balance. So if you, if you take an action, or if you're in an event that causes an action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, including in time and space. And now, you don't normally notice this in these stories because often people are ported back to places where there's a lot of people, so they wouldn't notice someone missing. Or if there's a smaller crowd, they still wouldn't know who the hell everyone is, so they wouldn't know someone is missing. And I don't think anything taken, any actions taken in the future, would have any effect because we're dealing with the multiverse ocean. To avoid paradoxes, that's how it works, if time travel to the past is possible, basically traveling to a different universe altogether. So anything that happens there has no effect on the future of the universe that you came from. Although it would affect the future of the universe that you're in, in that past. So you can kind of mess things up for them without knowing. Now time for the quote of the day. I like rice. Rice is great if you're hungry and want 2,000 of one thing. Mitch Hedberg. <laughs> yes, rice is the ultimate staple food. You know, people often attribute being poor, or if you're broke, then you're going to eat ramen. Which, yeah, ramen is cheap, but if you want the ultimate staple, cheap budget food, just get rice. And you can change it with different spices and herbs and add beans as well, which are also extremely, literally dirt cheap. Lentils, stuff like that. If you want to eat simple and cheap, get rice. And jasmine rice is the best rice, in my opinion. Especially for stir fries or just eating it as is. And on the other side, just get some oil, olive oil, avocado oil, and potatoes. And literally just dice them up, toss some spices in there, paprika, cayenne pepper, chili flakes, salt, pepper, olive oil, avocado oil, mix it up, toss it on a sheet, and bake it for, you know, 30-40 minutes until they're a nice golden brown. Toss them once between uh, being done. There you go. Simple, easy, extremely cheap meals, healthy. <laughs> Didn't intend this to be a recipe video, but there you go. Enjoy, James. 